Thank you. Welcome back, everybody, to our Documenting COVID-19 Symposium, uh, whether you're either in the room here at National Archives of Australia or online. Um, we have four speakers in the next session, um, Kevin Bradley, Craig Middleton, Tatiana Ansupuva, and Gail Lake. And I'll introduce these, everyone uh, as their turn comes to speak. The theme of this session is COVID-19, what documentation activities are underway? So we'll be hearing reports from these various, from the National, Lib National and State Libraries of Australasia, uh, National Museum of Australia, National Archives of Australia, and the National Film and Sound Archive in order. Uh, my first speaker is Kevin Bradley. Kevin is the Assistant Director General at the National Library of Australia, where he is responsible for building and managing the collection in all its forms. And in another life or another, another part of his life, he's a member of the UNESCO Memory of the World Preservation Subcommittee, that's at the international level, and the Australian Memory of the World Committee. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you, Ross. I think my slides are about to appear and you'll see I made a mistake on the first slide. Um, the library has undergone um, a reorganisation of how things work and I'm no longer the Assistant Director General responsible for Australian Collection and Reader Services, but the Assistant Director General responsible for Collection. I noticed that about two seconds ago. <laughs> as is always the case, the errors appear just as you get up to talk. Um, and though I'm from the National Library, I'm speaking on behalf of NASLA, the National and State Libraries um, of Australia. Um, so the National Library and the, state li and the State and Territory Libraries of Australia are charged with the responsibility of collecting, preserving and making accessible the nation's documentary history. The NASLA Libraries are well versed at planning collection activities to document and collect the transient materials, which we call ephemera from planned major events and do so regularly for events such as elections or plebiscites or whatever's occurring. Uh, but when unexpected and unplanned major things occur, we've generally had to rely on post-event collecting, such as calls for do you have things left over from that event or um, oral histories or, or, and so on. Unexpected events don't normally last as long as this pandemic. And the rapid escalation of that pandemic situation gave us... Oh, sorry. You should be looking at a nice picture. Does that work? There we go. Um, so the rapid escalation of the pandemic situation gave us little time to prepare. Also, there were additional limitations on activities uh, that we might have otherwise done, such as commissioning photographers or videographers because of the safety and welfare concerns and travel restrictions. The pandemic forced us to think laterally about how we could build collections that reflect a broad range of experience across Australia within the limitations of what could be achieved at a distance. A number of NASLA libraries A number of NASLA libraries called on the public to submit items representing uh, their own experience of the pandemic. Libraries ACT, State Library of South Australia and the State Library of Western Australia invited the public to submit photographs and videos for consideration in line with their collection development policies. State Library Victoria's Memory Bank uh, project proposed a weekly theme for the public to respond to, such as, what's in your fridge? ISO hair? and acts of kindness. Um, the State Library of New South Wales DX Lab invited people to write about their experiences in the diary files, an online platform with media support from ABC Radio Sydney. Now, it's, it's very usual. It's very usual for library staff to contribute to collecting activities around major events, such as elections. But they took on an even more active role for COVID collecting efforts. State Library of New South Wales asked staff to contribute COVID-related emails they received from businesses, schools and other mailing lists to capture digital material that could be, not be collected via NED. Uh, NED is the nationally deposit infrastructure shared by the NASLA libraries, um, the National Digital Legal Deposit Service. State Library of Victoria recruited staff working from home to take down 
to take photographs in their local area as they engage with essential activities during lockdown. The result is hundreds of images from various suburbs across an extended period, complete with descriptive metadata. Two libraries established formal relations or partnerships with local organisations who had shared collecting goals. Libraries Tasmania and the Tasmania Museum and Art Gallery worked together to capture the impact of COVID-19 on the lives and livelihoods of everyday Tasmanians, including submissions of poetry, photographs, artworks, personal accounts, videos and objects. The partnership allowed the two organisations to combine their efforts rather than competing for either people's attentions or their submissions, and that items more appropriate for a museum or an archive could go where best suited. And the State Library of Western Australia collaborated with the Centre for Stories, providing funding for the creation of audio stories that will be released as a podcast series reflecting the experiences of a diverse range of Western Australians. Two business as usual collecting practices will also contribute significantly to the long-term digital record for this year. State, the State Library of New South Wales Social Media Archive, running collaboration with CSIRO Data 61, is an archive of public social media content discussing life in New South Wales. The archive displays a snapshot of what people, uh, what got people talking in any given week and the keywords and hashtags they used, and the tenor of their emotional sentiment. Uh, the Australian Web Archive, managed by the National Library, began its annual six weeks .au whole of domain harvest between March and April. And this timing had the benefit of effectively capturing the nation's early online response to the pandemic and the rollout of the safety measures. And I've got Yep, that's the right one. Sorry, my. Uh, it's I've. I'm just trying. You're doing it there, are you? Yeah, yeah. You can have that. Take it back to the, the beginning of this slide. And the timing will work perfectly now. Go. Um, it's much better to wave at people than use the technology. It appears the focus of our selective web archive in collecting has been on critical government information and news sites. Um, while also doing what is possible to collect more broadly, to document various perspectives on the situation. Uh, for example, Mona's David Walsh's COVID-19 diary. What should be scrolling in front of you now is captures of the um, things that uh, we captured um, through, through our web archiving. And you can go to the portal in Trove to say, look at Trove web archiving. And I've just got some examples. Um, but we also have our curated collecting. Hundreds of websites have been collected. Most of these are collected on a frequent scheduled basis, such as daily or weekly. Um, this collecting is ongoing and is achieved with the support of the NASLA partners. Uh, the names of the supporting partners are credited on the relevant archive web pages. Um, for some reason that's not, is it? No, it's all right. Go back to, <laughs> amongst the NASLA partners, um, we'll come back one more. Um, amongst the NASLA partners, uh, and in addition to our um, Australian responsibilities, the National Library tends to have the greater international responsibility in collecting, and we do this with an awareness of the partners collecting and national collecting institutions in those countries where we have responsibility. So the IIPC, which is the International Internet Preservation Consortium Content Development Group, began an international collection of COVID-19 related web materials led by Columbia University and the Internet Archive. The National Library, uh, as a IIPC member, has contributed to a number of seed URLs to include the Australian perspective in this collection. The library has also identified Pacific websites for archiving using Archivet account and have developed a seed list of URLs for that. Based on collection development policy and guidelines and geographical priorities, web archiving will be conducted for Papua New Guinea, Fiji, New Caledonia, Vanuatu, Solomon Islands and Bougainville. The content covered in the web archiving collections will be focused mainly on polit political, sociological and cultural aspects. 
We're also working with the National Library's Indonesia office in identifying seed lists of URLs based on the criteria above and in accordance with our collection development policy, also working on our, our Broad Asia collecting remit. Now, if you take it forward to the picture you had of the person holding the, the microphone, that's Nikki Henningham, one back from, there we go. Um, so, most of the state and territory libraries run their own oral history programs. And I should say there's a multi-speed aspect to collecting this. The things we have to get right away or we'll lose them, but it's the things we need to get as we move along in time and it's the things that years from now will come to our collections. Oral history belongs to one of those reflective things. But in the urgency of the moment, there's also some acquisitions that happen at the time. So most state and territory libraries run their own oral history programs and are aware of each other's work through various networks, either through NASLA or through their shared membership of the Oral History Association. During the height of the pandemic, visiting people with or without a recorder was deemed unwise and having great potential to increase the spread of COVID. And so most places suspended their interview programs. Some undertook interviewing on Zoom, which suited some programs. However, the file format that Zoom captures information on is not well suited to archiving, and so the National Library decided to suspend their interviewing and developed a set of guidelines for conducting interviews where local law was allowed and the risks of infection were managed. And of course, that process is now underway. But um, there's always opportunity. The Library also collects the sounds of the built and natural environment. Um, we'll come to this next slide in a minute. The library also collects sounds of the built and natural environment. As an analogy, this is like the oral equivalent of a photograph, capturing an audible image of the environment. The library commissioned an interesting project where one of our experienced oral history interviewers took a recorder to the streets of Melbourne when, during lockdown and made recordings in places where the sounds are most often obscured by the people and the traffic noise of the city. The opportunity to capture such sounds may never present themselves again, and they're quite moving to hear to hear that sounds of, of the, um, the, the unbusy city, if you like. Uh, and the high quality audio was supplemented by professional photographs. And that photo that was in the previous slide was Nikki Henningham standing outside the MCG on a, a Saturday afternoon um, when the football wasn't being played, or at least people were not there seeing it. Um, this poster that you see now is by South Australian artist Peter Drew. Uh, it's extremely evocative and captured the feeling of isolation that was felt across Australia. It was acquired digitally, like many of our posters and documents, not just because it was convenient, but also because this was the way it was distributed. As a way of bringing this presentation to a conclusion, it was the shared infrastructure and shared relationships that allowed the NASL libraries to work together to the extent they did. NED, the National e Deposit Infrastructure, um, via national, um, has received many publications. But look, as an example of how the cooperation around collecting infrastructure work, early in the pandemic, we were made aware of a new title being published in electronic format in Bondi called the Corona Chronicle. Um, in fact, it turns out there's now a couple of titles called Corona Chronicle that's become a popular name. National Libraries start pass that information on to the State Library of New South Wales, who encouraged the publisher to develop um, uh, to deposit the title in NED, which they did. You can now find it in Trove and the various library catalogues and access the, item room, the items in the reading rooms of those libraries. Um, and in time, of course, it will become more widely available when the um, that we have the permissions to do so, but it is there preserved for posterity. Um, it's the shared infrastructure and the developing ways of working together that allowed this publication to be captured for future generations. The National Collection, through the National Library, uh, the NASLA Libraries, are all made the richer by this shared approach. Thanks. Questions are at the end. They are, Kevin, yes. Thank you, Kevin, for that really interesting and comprehensive coverage of what the national and state libraries are doing to uh, document COVID 19. Uh, it's my pleasure now to introduce Craig Middleton. Craig is a curator at the National Museum of Australia and a visiting fellow at the, at the Australian National University. His research interests are in Australian social and political history, specifically histories of LGBTIQ identified communities and critical museology. Um, introduce Craig, thank you.
thank you. And I believe we have this working. Uh, so yes, my name's Craig. Um, thank you for having me. Um, I'm just going to jump right in. Um, the context we are currently living in has impacted the lives of Australians in many ways. From record-breaking temperatures and months of severe drought that led to an unprecedented bushfire season, that word unprecedented, which was called out earlier, um, to uh, a global pandemic that has changed everyday practices like work, education, shopping for food and going to the gym. These moments in our history have also incited really traumatic experiences, including unemployment, illness, and for many, death. These moments in our history are defining. We already know this. So how do we begin to document what are such fast-paced, fleeting, and changing phenomena like the 2019-2020 bushfire season and the COVID-19 global pandemic? This is the question on the lips of many museum professionals internationally and a reason why we are here today. I'm not going to give you a definitive answer, and in fact, I don't believe there is one, but what I will do is share with you how the National Museum of Australia has responded so far. So let's think first about this kind of collecting in opposition to how museums might usually tackle documenting and archiving from the distant past. Contemporary collecting is defined as collecting objects, materials, and stories from the recent past or present day events that represent culture in its current form. It seems like a relatively simple concept, but in practice opens up a range of issues and challenges. Ultimately, though, it offers unlimited possibilities to how we make history. The beauty of contemporary collecting is that it allows us to record, document, and capture history in much more complex and nuanced ways, creating histories that are more inclusive and more diverse than ever before. Now, to explain how the National Museum of Australia has been documenting COVID-19, I must also explain how we have responded to the 2019-2020 bushfire season. Rather than viewing these events of moments uh, of crisis in isolation, we have brought them together to explore how Australians respond to profound change. So as soon as the fires began uh, in July, 2019, it was as early as then, the staff at the National Museum of Australia started thinking about how best to respond uh, to these events for present and future generations, particularly through collecting. As the season developed and by mid November, it was clear that this fire, of, fire event was different than those that had been experienced before. It was longer, it was more intense, and, and the reach of the fires was something we hadn't seen. There were new weather patterns. So nearing the conclusion of the season, some objects had already been offered to us, including what you can see on the screen, the Bungendore Fireys Fridge. Um, if you're from the New South Wales ACT region, you'll be aware of that. Uh, if you're not, go to the National Museum's website and you can find the story there. But what struck us was the flow of information on social and digital channels, including social media and mainstream media agencies. The imagery, videography and experiences were powerful and compelling. So how could we capture that for future generations? Uh, so towards the end of the fire season and to also mark the, the acquisition of the Bungendore Fires Fridge, we launched a Facebook group on the 21st of February with a simple call to action that Australians who wished to share their experiences or media from the fires were invited to join a national conversation around these issues. The group quickly grew to almost 300 members and they were sharing a range of stories and personal experiences. And one I remember um, quite clearly was from the Kama Bushfire Relief Centre and it was titled, Our Wall of Safe. It read, we started on 5th of January. The Sunday after the fire took around 70 properties in our little village and surrounding community. No power, no phones, so no one knew about neighbours, friends, relatives. After a long hug as they entered, everyone who came into the centre was then asked to put their name and that they were safe on a sticky note and tape it to the wall. So many tears of relief were shed in front of the notes in the first couple of weeks as people checked on each other. It's still there, I never want to take it down. So that's just one of many personal and powerful stories that were shared on this group. And so the social environment that is Facebook meant that group members were not only sharing and telling their stories, but they were also showing support, uh, regardless of their geographic location or the kind of impact that they had experienced. So before the bushfire season, ended, officially ended. The first case of COVID-19 was recorded in Australia on the 25th of January, 2020. And I'm not gonna spend time explaining what happened, because we know. 
Um, but drawing on the success of Fridge Door Fire Stories, uh, we launched another Facebook group, uh, bridging the distance, sharing our COVID-19 pandemic experiences, which asked the Australian public to share their experiences of the pandemic in real time in a similar way to Fridge Door Fire Stories, but rather than reflecting on an event after the fact, we were asking people to share their story as it happened. So we had a range of responses through this page. Some turned to humour to grapple with change plans. I turned 50 years old on Mother's Day. The plan was to be in a hot air balloon over Alice Springs. So instead, in the living room. I set up blankets, helium balloons, printouts of the landscape at Uluru, and off we went. I'm pleased to report we had a safe landing. Others explained how their home lives had been impacted. I'm not keen on risking catching COVID-19 and spreading it to my loved ones. I have taken a new view on life and am becoming more self-sustainable at home. First time buying fresh fruit in three months and it was washed with soap and water. And others shared of their experiences being stopped at closed borders. After traveling around the West for the last 18 months, we got isolated in Lancelin, WA, about an hour or so north of Perth. We have been here for seven weeks in the caravan park, virtually on our own. It's clean, fresh air, a beautiful spot. So we've been quite lucky. For the National Museum of Australia, social media has been an opportunity to publicly commit to documenting these moments of profound change, offer safe spaces for a particular audience to share experiences, and offer some connection in times of disconnection and physical distancing, while also allowing the museum to connect with members of the public who might not feel their story is museum worthy if we had approached collecting in the usual way. These groups are now and continue to be timelines of human experience that we can draw on now and in years to come. They will be archived when their public use has exhausted itself. Now, extending on the success of these two um, social media projects, uh, a few weeks ago on the 27th of November, we launched Momentous, sharing bushfire and pandemic stories. So we're bringing these two things together in a more considered way. It's as much a virtual exhibition as it is a website through which we continue to crowdsource stories in the form of text, images, audio, and video. The stories collected through this platform will create an online record of these significant moments in Australia's recent history and ask us as we view it to reflect on how Australians have responded and adapted to this change. Momentus will not only collect stories, but present stories back to the public so that online audiences, if they choose not to share, can still read, view, and reflect. In contrast to social media platforms, which are at their heart social, Momentus asks for more considered reflections, selections of images and audio video content. Users give titles to their post, 50 word descriptions to their images and multimedia content, and can allocate qualities to their stories. For example, hope, sadness, worry, and so on. Now for an example, uh, as part of Momentus, we invited a range of guest contributors to share a story, and one of those was Benjamin Law, who interviewed his Melbourne-based pregnant sister about her experience of COVID-19 lockdown. She said, I think the anxiety is a combination of things. I think it's the unknown because of not knowing what labour will bring, but as well as not knowing what the world is going to be like. I think the sadness comes from the fact that, like, you, you guys in Sydney won't be able to see baby, and also, like even mum, down the road, like literally, she's down the road, but she won't be able to see baby for we don't know how long, I guess. We also have a story from Peter Drew who, who created that really lovely poster and he shares his experience of how his art practice changed because of the pandemic. So rather than going out and pasting up his posters, he's having to send them out to communities who do the pasting up for him. Once, gathered, once these stories are gathered, we'll, we're going to be using the data to visualise our contributors, where they're from, how old they are, and by which qualities they identify their stories. So briefly, I just wanted to mention that the National Museum of Australia is committed to documenting these histories through multiple approaches. So from digital initiatives such as Momentus and our social media programs to more traditional modes of collecting such as donations. And taking this multiple approach methodology to creating history means we can access more voices and more stories from as diverse an audience as possible. It means our histories themselves on the official records become more inclusive and more diverse. The opportunities that come from thinking about how Australians might connect with us and vice versa, we can capture the messiness and complexity of today so that in 100, 200, 300 years, others will have a much better picture of today than we've had before. Now, I just wanna to finally touch on ethics. 
um, which, which you know, might inform some of the questions. So when deciding on how to approach contemporary collecting uh, moments of crisis, we must consider how what we are doing has the potential to re-harm and re-traumatise people. Asking members of the public to relive trauma, and in these cases, really recent trauma, can sometimes cause more harm than good. This is why we have approached contemporary collecting with a crowdsourcing model, not only to attempt to make it more democratic, but to ensure that contributions are opt-in and individuals can feel agency over their story, uh, deciding if, how, and when they share their story. Alongside this, we have had uh, facilitated conversations with health providers to train our staff to identify situations and content that could be categorised as distressing so that we can act accordingly in the best interest of our audiences. These are ongoing conversations that keep us accountable to the very material impacts of our work. We also know that digital access is fraught, and while social and digital technologies have made access much easier for a large group of people, we know for many reasons, including geographic location and privacy concerns, that digital technologies too can be inaccessible. And that's one of the reasons why we started on social media, but moved uh, to a more traditional website model, because when we, when we started with the social media projects, I was getting emails every day saying people wanted to contribute to this project, but not on social media. So we're opening it up. The social media is not decommissioned because we now have momentous, they're complementary, and they're, they're creating a, a wider record. So thank you for listening. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. And as someone who signed up to Bridging the Distance, um, I, I found it a most profoundly moving experience to read some of the, the posts on that, and they continue to now. And uh, it's a wonderful facility created by the National Museum, as is momentous. Thank you for your presentation, Craig. Now I'd like to call on Tatiana Antsipova from the National Archives of Australia. Tatiana is has worked in collecting and government archives for more than 20 years, including nine years at the Noel Butlin Archives Centre at the Australian National University and 15 years at the National Archives of Australia, where she is currently Director of Agency Engagement. She's also worked as a government archivist in Russia. So, Tatiana, thank you. OK, I wasn't sure whether I'd do it or not. I will. In early days, the plague, it's clear, visited your native hills and dales, and moans of sorrow then were heard along those brooks and streams. That gloomy year, in which there fell so many among the brave, the beautiful and good, has hardly left a trace except the memory of simple shepherds singing an old song, a sad and sweet one. A touch melodramatic, you may say, but the topic we're discussing here is quite moving on both the collective and personal levels and may ring very pertinent to some of us at the moment. The poem is by the best Russian poet of all times, Alexander Pushkin, who himself in 1830 lived through a cholera pandemic and spent three months in his country estate just when he was going to marry the love of his life who stayed in a different city. This turned out to be his most productive period as a poet didn't someone say that this happened to Shakespeare as well? Also, the point to make here is that we gathered today to acknowledge efforts and initiatives that make sure that we have more than just a song when documenting life with COVID-19. But I actually like more the point that Lauren made a bit earlier, that we don't end up with something overrepresented, biased, overly cheerful or bombastic. And if you're in documenting business, you're always cognizant of that and always worry that you do that. I will talk about the work that the National Archives of Australia is doing in ensuring that the pandemic is documented through the records of the Australian federal government. And this is not a special initiative. This is basically what we do anyway, every day, business as usual in a way. But it never hurts to emphasize the importance of certain things when they are really important. The first steps. In April earlier this year, the Director General of the Archives sent a letter to all federal government agency heads. This letter was also published in a special edition of our monthly bulletin. The letter highlighted to the agency heads the importance of records management, 
particularly heightened during the COVID-19 pandemic. And when we talk about records, we don't talk just about paper or analog, we talk about digital, we talk about data, we talk about everything. But in the end, it all records and provides the evidence of what's happened or was supposed to happen or what didn't happen. Well, the letter said, decisions being made by government to protect the health of Australians and to secure the country's social, economic and cultural well-being will affect the daily lives of millions of people. It is essential that these decisions and the basis for them are recorded to ensure accountability during and after the emergency and for the benefit of future generations. And this is very much in line with the UNESCO statement turning the, thre the threat of COVID-19 into an opportunity for greater support to documentary heritage, which was also issued in April and which also highlighted the importance of records management and preservation activities of documentary evidence around COVID-19. As I mentioned a bit earlier here, before, um, one of the main functions of my team at the National Archives is to provide permissions to government agencies to destroy records when they're no, no longer required for ongoing business and to identify the most important records that should be preserved permanently as national archives. Um, our legislation, the Archives Act, gives us this power. We do this in the form of legal instruments called records authorities, which describe at high level the functions and activities of the government and types of records associated with them. Well, we obviously don't list every record, but rather generalize to a certain degree. When COVID-19 situation worsened, to assist agencies in implementing National Archives requirements to identify permanent records and permissions to destroy temporary ones, we issued online guidelines that listed administrative records that will be created by all government agencies in response to the pandemic and mapped them to the disposal actions from the Administrative Functions Disposal Authority. Next year, we will review the types of COVID-related records created and collected by federal government and expect to come to a conclusion that for some types of records which currently have temporary retention status, the status will change and they will be reclassified as retainers national archives. So this work covers administrative records. We also advise the agencies to review their own records authorities that address records created during the performance of their core business. For example, the archives itself is a government agency, uh, performs a function of records custody and storage or records preservation management and so on. We asked our colleagues across government to look at their disposal coverage and if they see any gaps in relation to COVID related records as part of their core business to contact us. What about agencies whose core business is directly related to the pandemic? And we already heard from Dr. Brendan Murphy from the Department of Health. This is the main play from the federal government. In 2018, the Commonwealth Department of Health was issued with the records authority by the National Archives for the function of health protection and health emergencies. We describe it so. The core business of protecting the health of Australian community through national leadership and coordination and building appropriate capacity to detect, prevent, respond to and manage threats to public health and safety, as well as health emergencies in Australia and overseas likely to, to affect Australians. It was created for situations like ours and identifies records that would be created in this and similar situations. Um, however, we are planning to look at it next year again to identify gaps and already have some ideas and have engaged with the department in relation to some types of records. What's next? National Cabinet, National COVID-19 Commission Advisory Board. These are new government bodies that were created in government in response to the pandemic. The National COVID-19 um, Coordination Commission was created in March. It was renamed National COVID-19 Commission Advisory Board in July and was created to coordinate advice to the Prime Minister and the Australian Government on actions to anticipate and mitigate the economic and social impacts of the global pandemic. The scope of its measures is, um, is related to non-health aspects of the pandemic response. National Cabinet was also established in March to coordinate a national response to COVID-19 situation and in May it replaced the Council of Australian Governments as the peak intergovernmental forum. Its role is to manage matters of national significance that require coordinated action by all governments. 
And just to report to the community that we're currently working with the colleagues at the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet, who will help us to identify records created by the Board and the National Cabinet, and also to identify those records that will in time come to the National Archives. And just at the end, um, I would like to mention something different, and Lauren again mentioned, mentioned it before. That's the um, old-fashioned looking Australia Post letter writing campaign. Um, we partnered with Australia Post, which is uh, a Commonwealth agency, and supported them in this campaign, Dear Australia, to give Australians the opportunity to record their experiences of the pandemic. The three months campaign ended in August and eligible letters will be selected for transfer to the National Archives for preservation and made available for public access under the Archives Act. I would also like to add that uh, to make this particular story a little bit more interesting, it would be good to read some of the administrative and uh, core business records of Australia Post to get some insights how they came up with, the, with this campaign, what did they expect, and whether their expectations came to fruition or they found something interesting. So the business records will nicely complement the collection and perhaps tell a more complex and um, more evolved story. And I would like to end um, with a quote from that same very same letter from our Director General. The duty to document does not cease because of crisis. It becomes even more essential. Thank you, Tatiana. We all know the overarching role of government in managing this pandemic in this country, and, and it's very gratifying to know how comprehensively it will be recorded. Now my final speaker in the session is Gail Lake, the Chief Curator at the National Film and Sound Archive, where she oversees the collection development, cataloguing and preservation of 3.3 million analogue and digital items. She's, she's worked in various capacities in the film and cultural sectors, including the Australian Film Institute, Sydney Film Festival and Australian Film Commission Screen Australia. Over to you, Gail. Um, our mission is to, the NFSA's mission is to um, collect and preserve and share um, Australia's audiovisual uh, heritage. Uh, our collection uh, spans, um, is, spans a 120 year period um, from the early uh, days of cinema and even in some cases um, pre-cinema, uh, but we won't go there. And also right up to today, uh, where we are uh, collecting still um, both analogue items, but also uh, obviously a very firm and burgeoning born digital um, uh, production output. Um, we basically, um, in, ter in terms of looking um, at COVID, uh, and how we were going to actually uh, represent uh, uh, what was going on, how we were going to preserve uh, uh, and document um, the um, various creative industries um, that we uh, are involved in, the um, public, uh, the public sector. I guess today's home movies uh, look a little bit different now than they uh, did um, when Super 8 uh, was king. Um, and so we were looking at um, what programs we had in place. And within our broadcast uh, acquisition area, we had um, two programs that have been um, ongoing for um, a period of time. NewsCAF, um, which is um, the um, capture of um, broadcast television news and current affairs across capital cities. It's a program that's been running um, on a rostered basis of one week on um, per station right across Australia for 32 years. Uh, and so during that time we have um, 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 documented an incredible amount of uh, what has been happening uh, in Australia, what Australians are thinking, uh, what Australians are feeling and certainly what Australians are, are doing. Um, the other program um, that we have is uh, off-air off radio capture, 
um, which is an ongoing 24-hour cycle, capture of uh, um, material um, broadcast by radio stations um, through agreement with three of the major um, broadcasters uh, in Australia. Um, the, um, Let's go live now to Chris Rees and Chris, police are fighting plans for an another example Black Lives Matter rally piece. here in Sydney next week. Yeah, that's correct. Good evening, Mark. Uh, they are urging people not to attend that planned rally for Black Lives Matter next week. And uh, already, though, 4,000 people have expressed an interest on the organisers' Facebook page. Those same organisers have made an application for a permit. The police say they will come here to the Supreme Court to fight that action and try and make it illegal. And anyone that does turn up at that protest, the police commissioner, Mick Fuller, is saying he's urging his officers to issue as many tickets as possible. Yesterday, we saw $60,000 worth of fines on that party in Schofields. Today, another major fine, $5,000 on uh, a hotel in Armadale, the Imperial, for 30 people refusing to obey uh, the social distancing rules there. So the police showing that they mean business. They are certainly getting proactive on their COVID enforcement. Mark. The um, importance of, of uh, documenting this uh, slice of life uh, representation um, from our perspective is really important in terms of um, painting a picture, presenting a different way uh, and a different, um, a, a, a different view of what is happening in the world um, and in particularly in Australia. Um, the, it is not, um, from our perspective, it is part of a massive, uh, a massive uh, documentation um, that all of the NCIs are involved with of this very incredible period. Um, our, uh, we believe our collection should be read together um, by as many people as possible, by researchers. Um, and in terms of being able to provide this material, um, we certainly couldn't do that, um, given uh, the copyright um, considerations that we also must observe. Um, to actually um, provide this with uh, the goodwill uh, of our industry partners uh, within this. And indeed, we observe that same level of um, copyright concern and ICIP, um, uh, ICIP protocols in relation to Indigenous um, material. Um, we take it very seriously, and but we have an, Im an immense, um, we experience an immense set of goodwill um, from uh, the people that we deal with. Um, clients is to um, um, a firmer um, a description of, um, uh, of our partners because basically everybody we deal with is a partner in terms of presenting at what we do at the NFSA. One of the other ways um, that we um, will be, um, uh, and we are documenting um, COVID this year, is through our funded deliverables. Um, now, this is a program um, that uh, we have uh, in lieu of, um, of legal deposit for audiovisual materials, which does not exist in Australia, we have a funded deliverables program. Um, and basically anything that is uh, funded through Screen Australia or the um, state funding um, bodies, um, part of the production investment agreement is that they must deposit their material um, with the NFSA um, for preservation. Um, and so basically we cover um, all um, documentaries, feature films, virtual reality, web series, uh, shorts, um, and, and of course broadcast a scripted, uh, scripted drama as well. So in the collection um, so far this year, we have uh, taken in uh, a number of uh, deliverables or they are on their way um, uh, to being delivered to us. And um, uh, some of the examples of what we've taken in this year is a um, series called uh, Cancelled, uh, Retrograde, um, and the um, ability to actually um, participate and enjoy these productions is um, uh, provided in the, the links associated at the bottom of each of the, um, each of the titles. We, um, it is a, certainly a, a, um, what we're experiencing is Again, divided up into an immediate response where the production, um, the production has happened um, quickly. Um, but what we will actually see uh, is a very, a very much a long tail to this production sector uh, as well in terms of the creative expression and interpretation of what is happening uh, in this country and, and what um, creative, um, creative makers are actually uh, looking to explore um, through their practice uh, takes time. 
And so there are a number of um, titles as we move along here um, that we've also, um, we've also uh, looked at in terms of our acquisitions, our general acquisition activity. So we've uh, initiated some targeted oral history interviews um, and our targeted acquisitions also include some web series um, that weren't funded uh, through Screen Australia, but we've identified that should be part of the collection. And one, of course, is um, a very popular Love in, Lo Love in Lockdown. Um, again, the, um, the link is there if people actually would like to partake of it. It's, um, it's really very good. Um, we also have uh, a, a, reactive, um, a reactive component to our collection development activity um, and this is through um, donation offers, um, collection offers um, um, that um, randomly and um, prolifically come to us. Uh, and it's also we also have a, a, have initiated this this year with, with uh, Jamie Van Leeuwen from um, from uh, Melbourne um, Melbourne Melbourne lockdown. Uh, uh, so Jamie is uh, what we would call one of our citizen curator friends, uh, who has actually initiated his own project where he wants to um, and has invited people to participate by sending videos, photos, um, um, poems, drawings, any, anything. And he is going to utilise this material to actually create his own production. So we will take that final production and also selections from uh, the original material that were presented to him um, and create a package as part of um, his vision uh, of, um, of what COVID-19 has actually meant to him. Um, we've also um, taken recently into the collection um, Coronavirus Explained in Your Language from um, SBS. Um, and also, um, uh, we've also taken in Little J, um, uh, which is um, basically uh, in, in language for Indigenous um, youth to actually observe uh, instructions on and, and direction on how to observe COVID safe. Um, behaviour. So um, it's a very, very um, interesting, um, interesting period. Our clients um, and our friends range from the general public, um, as I said, right through to the um, commercial, uh, the commercial sectors uh, within the um, within the creative industries. Um, we ha have recently started taking um, and uh, accepting video games into the national collection. And you know that will take some time, and will be very, it will be very interesting to actually see uh, what um, what COVID nineteen will actually deliver in the video game sector. Um, I think it is going to be very interesting. It's a a very prolific uh, prolific uh, sector, and very. Um, economically um, uh, rewarding sector in terms of the the um, position of games within the global um, the global market space um, where to from here um, as I said we will be constantly tracking the funding rounds to see what has been funded and what has been um, produced um, through all of the notifications through um, the funding agencies um, we you know, anticipate um, that the potential incoming material um, and the time frame that it, it is involved in production will allow us to actually um, continually reassess our priorities uh, in terms of representation within the collection. And it also will provide um, an understanding um, an understanding the way that the um, community is developing in terms of their interpretation and how they have processed, um, the makers have actually processed what has gone on around them because the immediate response of, um, of uh, shock then actually over a period of time um, it finds a creative expression that is entirely different to its origins. So that in itself and that process is really um, very interesting. And we're not only just interested in the final productions, but we're also interested in uh, the documentation, the development papers around those, um, around those production activities, because that gives a picture 
uh, of the, um, it gives a, a picture of, of the actual production, not only about, as I said, the actual final product, but the thought processes, the emotions, the feelings, um, the intellectual, um, the uh, intellectual process that's gone into actually creating, uh, creating the, um, the film or the video game, or the oral history, or um, the TV series, or the web series. So or it, it really is um, you know, quite a remarkable um, collection to be involved in. Um, and it's, it's you know, very much a privilege. So the effects you know, of COVID will be long felt. Um, we're not, as everybody has you know, um, said, we're, we're, we're not through it, and we're not gonna be through it for a long time because the impact on the industries, uh, the commercial industries, um, you know, has been long felt. And indeed, we created, um, as we locked down our oral, hi oral history program, um, we created a series of, um, of um, interviews that were short-term, um, short-length, 30-minute um, snapshots of creatives who were actually hamstrung. They couldn't go on set. Uh, they, cinematographers weren't shooting. Um, and so directors, you know, weren't, weren't, weren't on location, um, actors weren't on location, um, and so we actually um, are creating a, a snapshot from that side of the, of the production uh, sector as well. And we're also looking at, um, at archiving instructions for the return to, um, the return to production as well, the um, instructions put out by Screen Australia and the other um, state agencies in terms of observance of, of COVID, um, COVID safe production activity. That in itself also paints a picture um, on the other side of that, um, for want of a better description, the am amateur enthusiasts, um, it does take time, I think, for people to process what, um, what ha they've experienced, to find, um, to find <coughs> pictures, to find words for it. Uh, and so we, um, it's a very busy time um, for the archive uh, in that respect. And it's, um, we think that it's, out of all of this, you know, the difficulty and the, the tragedy in some cases, there will come a very, very interesting creative expression um, of Australian culture. So thank you very much. Thank you, Gail. What a vast swathe of territory to cover in, in that particular organisation. It's uh, remarkable. As is everything represented by everyone on the platform today, uh, from, the national, from the libraries, museums, archives, and audiovisual archives, the great repositories for our documentary heritage, all are playing enormous roles in this process. And now we're going to throw the meeting open to questions again for each of our panellists, or generally. Um, I don't know if there's any online. Yes, there is already. I might take this one first and then throw the meeting open to those in the room. The question is, what checklist or framework have speakers employed to counter biases and gaps inevitable when one collects through invitation crowdsourcing? So over to you, panel. I can start, Phil. Yeah. I would say the first thing um, when using crowdsourcing is don't rely on just crowdsourcing. It is very, the very first thing to do. Um, and I, I know from um, many projects we've run, when we look at our, um, our demographic of people we, we attract, and I know many of us institutions often use the ABC as a way of reaching people, and that attracts a very particular demographic. So you've got to say, how do we rely on, how do we, how do we approach groups outside of those sort of crowdsourcing, which is a general invitation, so targeting areas to see where things are missing, doing whole of domain harvests, um, trying to approach it in a way that um, uh, doesn't put the onus either on us or on our particular audience to determine who will respond to us, so to encourage broad responses. Thank you, Kevin. Any other panellists wish to respond to this one? Just that I agree in terms of not just relying on crowdsourcing and you know I talked about the multiple approach methodology which is you know what we're all doing clearly from these conversations um, but it's also you know I kind of think about how we approach 
this less of a checklist and a framework and more of a research process. So if you were researching the distant past, you'd be looking at primary sources, documents, archives. When you're doing it now, you're looking at uh, the, the, the media agencies. You're going out and talking to people, talking to communities, um, you know, tapping networks. And if you have that conversation and, and, and have many conversations, you can actually identify gaps in a much more nuanced way. Um, so, so, you know, those and, and being self reflective and critically reflective of the kinds of content that you're getting in. So, not just accepting it, oh, cool, check, let's go, you know, looking at it, having conversations with people about it, and not just yourself because you've only got one worldview. You need to bring in others from outside of your organization and outside of your project teams to have those conversations with, otherwise, you'll inevitably miss something. Tatiana. We normally don't crowdsource, but um, I'd imagine the, the most important thing to do when you do crowdsource is to, and you end up with a collection, sort of a bunch of documentary evidence, in it, is to describe it in such a way and, and to put your activity into context so you explain what it was that it's been not, not curated or curated, and these were the rules that we selected things. So it's really to explain to everybody who's going to use this collection in the future what were the circumstances of its creation, what was happening around. And this will give the information for people to assess the veracity, uh, the bias, non-bias um, status of this collection. Thank you. That's right. You right? Uh, any more questions? No. Uh, any questions from me? David. Perhaps following on from that uh, discussion, um, I'm just wondering, as we, as we go further through this experience, um, and to some of your comments, Craig, about you know, some of the issues, the ethical issues uh, that are being dealt with in terms of personal stories and how to deal with traumatic experiences, etc., to what extent are we discovering, as we go through this, that we're discovering more significance in the material we're collecting than we had anticipated at the beginning of this exercise? You know, are we developing our idea about what is significant during the time of crisis? And then, and also to also following on from that previous discussion, as we go through this, are we are we seeing any gaps in what we're collecting. You know, we are imagining now that at the end of all of this, we will have collected the loudest voices across Australia, which is not to say that's the wrong thing to do. I mean, we, you know, we, we do need to collect those voices, but um, we are already starting to see that perhaps we're going to leave something out. You know, is there more do we think that we should be collecting uh, that we haven't been able to attend to? I think... Um, uh you know, that, that's uh, a, it's great questions. And just on the sort of second part of your questioning about the, the loudest voices, that's what's been the great thing about the social media because all of the examples I gave you, other than Benjamin Law, um, were just everyday, unremarkable experiences. And that's what we're getting through those social mm -hmm. platforms. And that's why I made the point that actually if we were to do it in a, in a different way, calling for people to donate, for example, most of those people would be like, oh, that's not interesting. The, the woman who set up Uluru in her, in her living room would have been like, why would they care about this? But because we jumped on the, tech, the social technology that already exists and people use in that way to share with you what they had for breakfast, you know, we're getting those things. So we're actually collecting stories and experiences of um, not uh, as a, a blanket rule, but like, you know, of more uh, everyday Australians rather than just the loudest, loudest voices. And I've forgotten your first part of your question. Are we, um, are we starting to already see what, you know, whether it's yeah. Um, yeah, descriptive sorry, standards yeah. or, you know, we're we starting to see um, uh, new aspects of significance. You know, the more material we collect, at the beginning we might not have realised the significance of isolation experiences, mm. but we did want to know about, you know, musical creativity or something. But yeah. Now we understand love, you know, during a period of isolation, for example. Is, is there more sort of cultural significance? It's definitely for us changed from the beginning because the social groups have been active since April. You know, the first 
um, tranche of, of responses uh, related to um, uh, anxiety-based panic buying and toilet paper crises and all sorts of things. And then you could, you could as you, you know, were reflecting on the content, that anxiety faded away and it was people reflecting on how their lives were changing, homeschooling their young people, um, you know, the, the challenges of Zoom and also the humorous aspects of those things. You know, it has changed. Um, I, I guess, you know, the social platforms took a turn when Victoria went into another lockdown because then we returned to some of that um, content, particularly from Victorian audiences. Um, but that's interesting in itself in terms of a trajectory of this year for that group of people. Um, but it's an ongoing process. And so, yes, um, to, to say yes to that, and it will continue to change. And I guess what's going to be really interesting is what next year looks like when we see more impacts uh, on the economic front. Now, this also question. respond to that one, sorry. Yeah, please. But I was going to say, the, uh, thinking about significance, and it's, a, a, it's really important to think about anything we do in terms of significance, but significance has a temporal aspect to it as well. Uh, what's significant now may not be the thing that 100 years from now people will be asking about COVID in the same way as the things we ask about the, uh, the Spanish flu epidemic are quite different. Um, and all the things that we've had and put up from that in some ways represent the collecting from the time rather than the present, the questions we have. And so we need to divide our collecting up um, into those things that we decide we need to collect comprehensively, those things that we want to collect selectively, and those things we want to collect in a representative way to signify an error. And at the same time, thinking about what will be the meaning of this material both now, but what will be the meaning of this material in 100 years' time? Or in the case of the archives, in 20 years when the archive acts allows to make it available. And we have examined um, some of our collections to look at that. Uh, clearly, legislatively, the, the state and national libraries collect everything published, and so that's comprehensive straight off the bat. Um, but then when we start saying, what are we doing selectively? Um, what are we doing representatively? I'd say that the representative aspect is a lot of the ephemera collecting. We're collecting those that represent particular things that we see, themes that appear. But the other aspect of it is that temporal aspect, is when you run an oral history project or um, send out um, photographers or send out people to document, you're doing that retrospectively and you begin to develop a different sense of what significance is over time. And so the th questions we'll ask in the future will be different both of the people we see and the collections we have. And so banding those things is how we approach it. And I'll just have a quick comment to that to, to tell David. Yes. And that's what I was talking about too, that we already, National Archives, ourselves have all the way identified the records that would be created during a pandemic, but now having experienced it and still experiencing it, we're already getting some ideas that mm. what was less significant, say in 2018, when we worked with the Department of Health in 2020 <laughs> was um, appears to be more significant. So it's, it's, it's a constant kind of reappraisal process. You constantly think what is more, um, what is more significant and as the time passes. And yeah, who would have thought toilet paper? <laughs> Gail. Um, I think in terms of um, um, when we're talking about significance of, um, of um, creative expression, I mean, it is significant for that individual, that group of individuals who actually made um, made the film or the recording or you know the web series or whatever and so in, in many cases we take our lead um, from that level I guess of um, a, a, that democratic approach uh, mm -hmm. as well and um, the NFSA's collection um, you know is representative we we can't collect everything like any collecting um, organisation, um, but we certainly um, we certainly take our lead from um, you know the, the depositors or the donors who actually um, you know are taking the time to contact us and say I think this is really important or this was in mum and dad's garage they've both passed away I don't want to deal with this and then we have to then we have to go through that notion of applying significance mm -hmm. um, with with the individual. Thank you all for those responses. There's a question here for Tatiana, but I think could e equally be asked, answered by anybody from National Archives. Uh, the state institutions struggling to get submissions for their COVID collecting, 
Why did NAA create a campaign to send Australia Post letters? So open, open to NAA people. Thank <laughs> Well, I'm happy to be corrected by people who were in the country at the time. I was uh, in a foreign country in a COVID-related lockdown, uh, but there was no shortage of toilet paper, can tell you that. <laughs> uh, my understanding that the NAA, NAA did not create this campaign. Australia Post mm. uh, did it on its own initiative. Uh, and as I said, that's why I said it would be interesting to read Australia Post. Um, thoughts on why and how they came with this campaign. What the archives did, we supported because we looked at it and thought, oh, well, that's an interesting exercise, uh, a footnote or a side story on what's happening at the moment. Let's see what happens. It would be a very small percentage of what we usually take as part of our collection, so we didn't see any harm in supporting that as to why Australia Post created. Come in 20 years to the National Archives, we'll make these records available. I don't know if there's anything else to add. Can I add? Look, it, it was um, precisely for that diversity. As, as Tatiana says, it was Australia Post's idea. But, you know, given, uh, you know, the collection of social media, mm. there's, there's, a, there's a huge, you know, uh, avalanche of digital information that is being collected, um, and, and rightly so. Um, but I, I was quite intrigued by Australia Post's idea about, well, you know, what about letter writing? And... And the process of writing a letter, you know, a very old-fashioned analogue process, is often a collaborative event. It's often sort of things that grandparents and grandchildren get involved in doing and all. It's, it's like a school project sort of thing. And it's just a different aspect. It's a different facet mm -hmm. of the experience. Um, it's, a, it's a more sort of a, a longer, more sort of perhaps even thoughtful uh, process. It's just another part of documentary mm -hmm. heritage. But it, again, it's about you know, how representative is the collection. So, you know, this, I think this was the only um, sort of aspect that would pick up something like that, that aspect of documentary heritage. And again, for its intergenerational value, I think it, it will be a very interesting part of the, uh, the collection. But as Tatiana says, I, I, we can't claim credit for it. It was Australia Post's idea. And of course, they would like people to post more letters. And so it fits in with their objectives and it also um, fitted in with ours. And just as a kind of a, a note to that as well, how we assessed that these um, letters should come to the collection. The criterion was in the Records Authority for Australia Post as something that documents history of postal services in Australia because, as David say, uh, perhaps this could be the last <laughs> massive letter writing campaign and that significance of this collection that looks a bit quaint perhaps at the moment will rise uh, with the time. You never know. <laughs> no. uh, Rachel. I'm going to put on my um, Documenting Australian Society broader hat at this point and say, um, especially some of the National Library, National Archives, you've got very strict legislative responsibilities about what you can take in and you're not always flexible around that. Um, but for all of you, has anyone been able, been in a position during this, this situation where you've had someone come to you and say, I would like you to take this, and you go, that's amazing, but I can't fit it into my collection policy. And have you then had scope or the ability to reach out to other people, perhaps not national institutions, perhaps smaller local institutions, uh, in the spirit of keeping this thing, this important thing, uh, but you're not able to do it and making it a more collective national collection. I can start with that one if you like. I should correct you, it doesn't restrict what we can take in, it defines what we, are, we must take in, if you like. Um, so it's the reverse of what you said there. But in, into the nub of your question, which is about what do we do with the things we reject, yes, absolutely. We, um, uh, best example, in the National Library, and I, I should say I was speaking on behalf of NASLA before, now I'm speaking on behalf of the National Library. Um, the, the National Library's manuscript for collection, for instance, we take in between a quarter and a third of all the things we're offered, um, but we take it as a, an important responsibility for anything that comes in to say, we can't take this, we think it belongs in a state collection or a university collection, or perhaps you should have gone to the National Archives or any of those sorts of things. So yeah, then that's, that's a fundamental part of what we do and I think other institutions do the same as well. 
We've, um, yeah, we have on many occasions referred, um, referred material to other collecting institutions. It's, um, you know, I think from all of our perspectives, it, it's, it's not a competition. Mm. Um, and as long as, it's, as long as the material is preserved and, you know, and cared for and made available um, in the right place, then we're serving the public of Australia. Yeah, we do it all the time too. Yeah. Anne-Marie. I've just been thinking about what was the first mass collecting effort in Australia for documenting a mass event and how fun it would be if you could have interviewed one in ten people who were present at Federation on the day that... Um, <laughs> The Federation was declared at Centennial Park in 1st of January 1901. I don't think anybody was there doing that, but... So the next one might be the First World War. Um, and I know from a study that I made of this once that um, the War Memorial waited until the 1920s to, to write to people, ex-servicemen and, and families of those who died. And I think in, the, in a period of about five years, sent out about 5,000 donor requests and received, and here I, with my anecdote, I actually can't remember the number of acquisitions that made in that time because it was a bit hard to extract the data, but probably less than a thousand in that time. So that's a very small amount compared to what we're able to collect now. And I'm not making this point any further except just as a comparison of the am massive amount of data that we are now able to collect mm -hmm. and, and think about these questions about bias and gaps and diversity because those issues were not much raised by the War Memorial. It didn't document how it selected people for um, donor requests and it didn't really reflect on whether it was getting what it wanted except it worried a bit that Charles Bean wasn't getting quite enough material for the writing of his, <laughs> of his official histories. But other than that, it, it just rolled on in a way run by two or three people who all knew each other and all who had all experienced the war, so they knew the event really well. And there wasn't an outside perspective on it the way we're talking about now. Just a point, just an anecdote to say um, how different things are now, and I hope more democratic than they used to be. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, we're running slightly over time, but um, there's one, just one quick question here on the board here uh, that I'll deal with, and now I think we should break for our next, for our sec next session. Um, the Australian Centre for the Moving Image collects video games. Is this a double up? What does the NFSA bring that is different? I guess a quick response. <laughs> we're, um, we're actually working with ACME um, mm -hmm. and um, um, the Museum of um, Arts and Applied uh, Sciences um, and to actually work this out so that we don't duplicate and that we all have limited resources uh, and certainly the NFSA is bringing... Um, uh, bringing to the equation, um, um, working towards a solution of actually how to archive the complexities of video games and the myriad of, um, of um, issues related to um, uh, file formats. And um, we took one video game in recently and had 60,000 files attached to it. So um, we're, we're, we're doing that bit. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, thank you everyone on the panel, for Kevin, Craig, Tatiana and Gail, uh, and for the audience for their questions and responses. Uh, it's been a tremendous session. I think we've been able to learn an enormous amount about what everyone is doing, and it's certainly grounds for great optimism. We'll cover all those gaps somehow or other, I think, one way or another. But uh, just break now for a few minutes. We're back again at uh, quarter past two for our next session. Thank you. <laughs>